And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought it uh, of the firstborn of his flock of, his, of, of, their, of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his uh, countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you. But you should rule over it. Father, in Jesus' mighty name, we ask you that as we consider your word, that your Holy Spirit would just come and help us understand, giving, giving us insight into your wisdom, into your the authority of your word, that we may be transformed by it. Father, in Jesus' mighty name, we want to glorify you and we want to be edified by you, Lord. Amen. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Praise God. So one of the questions that I want to ask you is, how is your relationship with God? How is your relationship with God? Because that is pretty much, you know, what we want to answer today. We want to consider exactly this very question. How is our relationship with God? Because in this past, you know, you, you probably know the, the story of uh, Cain and Abel. And, you know, someone said, you know, why didn't Cain offer the right uh, sacrifice? Because Cain wasn't able. Where are the drums? All right, you guys are awake already. <laughs> I know, I know, my kids are going to tell me, Dad, please. I know what they're going to tell me. You know, they're going to say, Dad, please don't. All right. You see, what is funny is what is funny is my explanation rather than the joke, right? <laughs> All right. So, well, you know the story of Cain and Abel. You know, here in this passage, we see something for the very first time, which is the the act of sacrificing, offering sacrifices to God. Now, most likely, this is not the first time that this happens in the history of mankind. God already had shown Adam and Eve how to do this and, and why they needed to do this. Uh, so I am sure that Adam and Eve had taught all their children on how to serve God, how to approach the throne of God, how to approach his presence and how to sacrifice to God. But here we see the story of these two brothers, Cain and Abel, you know, uh, uh, in, as the very first narrative of the sacrifices that they were to uh, bring before the Lord. And so uh, one of, you know, one of the things, you know, that we see here is that both Abel and Cain brought an offering to God. Amen. It says that God, that Cain brought an offering to Jehovah from the fruit of the earth. And, uh, and verse 4 says, And Abel also brought the firstborn of his sheep. Now, one of the things, you know, we see here something that should be, uh, that, that we should not overlook. And this is so important. And that is that before the offering of both is accepted, they themselves should have been accepted. That is very interesting. You know, it is very interesting that it says there, if we go back and read the passage, we would read that God, uh, so, you know, let, let's go back to reading it, all right? It says in verse 4, Abel also, it says here, I'm sorry, uh, Abel also brought the offering of his first uh, of his flock and of their fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering. In other words, the Lord accepted, recognized that uh, you know Abel and his offering. And then it says, and Cain, and then it says also here, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And so one of the things that we see here in the first place is that, you know, it is uh, that God is more, more interested in us than in our offering. And that is so important. You know, 
And, and that is so important because many times we, uh, we, especially in today's society, where people are thinking that as long as they go to church, as long as they, they sing the songs, as long as they do what they do, and even, uh, even serving God, you know, that that is enough. And therefore, the, the, the person himself or herself is not required to change. And I think that the reason why we think that is because of our background. I think that most of us come uh, from a religious background where they taught us that all you needed to do was to go to church on Sunday, confess, and do your penitence, you know, pray some prayers, and then you could go out in the world and live as if there is no God. So, you know, on Sundays, it was very common for people, and even today, they, people still do it. They go to church on Sunday, right? They confess, they sing the songs, they do the prayers, and then they go and do the drinking, they do the drug, ad, the, the drug addiction, they do the, the pornography, they do uh, the foul language, they do the, uh, the adulteration, they do everything, right? And, and they're okay because, after all, I already went to church. Mm, be careful. Because one of the things that we need to understand that even before we can present an offering that is acceptable to God, an offering that will please him, you and I need to examine ourselves and you and I need to, uh, to make sure that we, we, the person, is being accepted, acceptable to him. You know why? Because one of the things that we see in this is that even though there was no law yet, Right? Even though there was no law had given, be, been given yet. Okay? I mean, Moses is telling us the story that happened uh, centuries before. He's telling us a story that, is, that happened centuries before where there was no law yet. And yet, in, through the sacrifice, we learn that God is more important in the relationship with his people than in the sacrifices themselves. And so we find that at first... First says that Abel was acceptable, but Cain was not acceptable. And so you have to wonder, why was one acceptable and, and not the other? Why was Abel accepted and not Cain? Because after they come, their offering is not acceptable. And so we come to, you know, we, we want to you know, talk about this today. Amen. We want to talk about this because... Uh, my belief is that you and I, we are here because we want to be acceptable to God. Amen, church? We want to be acceptable to God. And so we see here, you know, God, how he evaluates. I just want to share two things, right? So today may be a short sermon. But I want to, you know, share two things that are so important to us. Here we see God, how he evaluates the offering, Right? Uh, the the, the offer, offering giver before he evaluates the offering. And that is so important because it says here, uh, and the Lord respected Abel in his offering, but he did not respect Cain in his offering. Hallelujah. You see, one of the things that we need to understand is that, you know, uh, and that we see in this passage is that, you know, even though the law had not been given, we see the the, you know, signs of the law. You know, a, a lot of times one of the things that we need to understand is that, you know, we know what is wrong or what, what is right and what is wrong, not because so much we saw it in the book, but God had, has put that in us. You know, you know, that's called the, the conscious. Right? This, this, this little apparatus that I don't know where in the body, I don't know where in our soul conscious is. But there's this little apparatus that God has given us that tells us when we have done something wrong or when we have done something right. Now, here comes John, the Apostle John, telling us also, in, as he writes, he says, My children, if your conscience accuses you, maybe James, I, don't, I forget. If your conscience accuses you, greater is God. Oh, in that case, what is the writer saying? Is that if our conscience tells us that there's something that we're doing wrong, that we need better stop. Because the conscience is like that the red, uh, the, the red blinking, red, annoying light, amen, right in front of your face that says, stop, 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 stop. You're doing wrong. You're doing wrong. 
And, and then we say we do wrong, but instead of paying attention to that light, we look the other way. We don't want to see the light because we have already decided to do wrong. But then we feel guilty. Right? So one of the things that we need to understand here is that God, God is not so much interested in your sacrifices. I mean, David writes that truth so many times through the Psalms. He, he even said, I will not give God a sacrifice that is not, that is not going to cost me anything. I would not present God a, a burnt offering that doesn't cost me anything. Samuel told, uh, told uh, Saul, you know, the first king of Israel, he says, for God prefers your obedience than your sacrifices. Right? Yes, God prefers our obedience. You know why our obedience? Because our obedience comes from the heart. And God wants our heart before he wants our sacrifices. You see, the sacrifice is very important. It is. Don't undermine it. It is very important. What you do for God is very important. Our service to him is very important. God wants our service to him. Amen. He wants our worship. As a matter of fact, you know, when you think about why we exist on this earth, you know, we can see in this passage two things. One is worship. Amen. This, this banner here that says that why we exist. We exist to worship God and we exist to have fellowship with him. These two things are so important to God and they should also be important to us. Amen. Why? Because you see, here's the thing. If your heart is right with God then your offering is going to be right. Amen? If, if, if you and I are right with God, you're going to want to give the best to God, just like Cain, uh, Abel. Abel gave, you see, it's, it's interesting because a lot of times we talk about, we go back and forth arguing about why was it that God didn't accept Cain's offering and why did uh, he accepted Abel's. And we go back and forth talking about theology and why, why that is. There's a couple of passages that I want us to read that will tell us a little bit more, that show us more attitude than the actual act of the sacrifice of what it, what it was. So we find in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, the writer to the Hebrews in this chapter says that by faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which we obtain uh, witness that he was righteous. God testifying of these gifts. And through, through it. He being dead. Is still speaks. One of the things that we find. In Cain is that his attitude was wrong. And because his attitude is wrong. His acts are wrong. His conduct is wrong. Isn't that true? I, I was. I was uh, I'm reading this little book. By uh, John Maxwell. I think all of you guys know John Maxwell. And, and it, this book is called Attitude 101. It's an excellent little book. If you can, if you can have it, if you can find it, I, I recommend it to you. And in this book, he talks about how uh, he quotes, he's quoting someone else, and I forget who he's quoting, but the book says that uh, when facing trials, when facing challenges in life, that it, that it is determined by whether or not you're going to overcome your trial even, even, even before you start doing anything, by your attitude. Attitude is 80% of the battle. If your attitude is right, then chances are that you're going to overcome. Right? Whatever you have to face. Well, in this case, attitude is very important. God is looking at the heart. He's looking at the attitude of the heart with how we approach him. And many times, you know, our attitude is wrong. Our attitude is that as long as I do what I do, I can serve God. I can, I can, you know, I can do whatever, you know, whether it's in, in the church or outside of the church. As long as I am serving him, I can do whatever I want. I can live whatever, however I want. And God says, no, because I want you before you. I want your service. I want you before I want your sacrifice. That's why God always is calling us, give me your heart, give me your heart, give me your heart. You know, that's why he's, he's always, the word of God is always encouraging, exhorting us to, you know, above all things, guard your heart. Because from it uh, flows life. 
right? So we, our heart is so important to God, right? That if our heart is not right, our, our, our offering, our service is not going to be right. And so if we want God to accept our service to him, then we, we must do it with the heart of integrity, with, with sincerity of heart, with purity of heart, with a clean heart. Amen? Because when our heart is right and we are acceptable to him, then he will accept our offering. He will be pleased with our service. And he will bless our service to him. He will bless what you do for him and in his name. He will bless it if you have the right approach to God, if, you, if your attitude is right with God. Amen? And this is, this is what we see here. Uh, you know, uh, in 1 John, the Apostle John also contributes. And in chapter 3, verse 12, he, he, he says, not as Cain, of course, talking about our, our offering to God, our service, our heart, our attitude to God. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murderer and murder his brother. I'm sorry. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brother's righteous. Hmm. When, when our heart is right for God, our works, our conduct, our actions are going to be right. They're going to be acceptable to God. But if our heart is not right with God, then what we do will be wrong. It would not be acceptable to God. And it's interesting because what happens, you know, what happens when, uh, when we are not acceptable to God is that we end up getting uh, angry, right? It, it, you know, this is exactly... What happens here? So, you know, so we, we find, you know, people say, well, there's no more sacrifices needed, right? A lot of people say there's no more sacrifices needed. But there's actually a sacrifice that God is looking for from us. And it, it's found in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. If you can go with me, Romans 12, 1. Listen to what it says. The, the Apostle Paul, with such eagerness, eagerness with such passion, and, and actually, it seems like, like he's asking actually with pain in his, in his heart. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your uh, reasonable service. In other words, Paul is, uh, the, yeah, Paul is saying that the, the very least that we, you and I can do, it is to present our bodies, to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God. Amen? Because that is what God is looking for. And so, so we find that, that, you know, that, that the sacrifice actually is supposed to uh, compel us to examine ourselves, right? It's supposed to compel us to examine ourselves and ask our, ourselves the question, how is my relationship with God? How are God, how is God and I, how are we doing? How are we doing? Am I, am I acceptable to me? Is God pleased with me? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Is God pleased with me? I think that's a good question for us to ask from time to time. Is God pleased with me? Are my attitudes pleasing with him, to him? Are my, is my conduct pleasing to him? Huh? And so, and so, you know, it, it is important for us to do. And you know what? Our conscience tells us if we are right or not, right? Yeah. We know. You see, there's, 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 you know, there's two people that we can never deceive, and that is you and God. You, I cannot deceive me, and I can never deceive God, because God knows my heart exactly where I'm at. And so, and so, what happens? What happens? When, we, when our heart is not right, well, we are going to see what, how uh, Cain reacts to God refusing his, his, uh, his sacrifice. And we find, it says here in verse 5, in the second part, Cain was very angry and his uh, countenance fell. Now, you know, it's very interesting because uh, up to this point, uh, Cain hasn't yet killed 
uh, Abel. And God hasn't really confronted him. It just says that he was angry and that his, his countenance fell. In other words, he was angry and it showed. You know? And some people can really show that they're angry, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, you know, you know. Uh, my wife and I talk about, you know, because my, 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 people have told me, his, your face shows when you're upset. And I said, I know, I know, I know. You know, I don't have a poker, a poker a player face. I don't have a poker face. You know, people have played poker. I, I, I wouldn't make a good poker player because I would lose. Because they would see my face and they would say, oh, this guy, is either if I have a good hand or if I have a bad hand, they would know it just by looking at my face, right? I don't have a poker face, right? And so have you seen, have you seen those people that play poker? You know, it's like you can't read their faces. There's no, there's a, they're expressionless, right? You can't read them, right? And so it's so difficult to tell whether or not they have a good hand. And so th that is necessary for playing poker. But... But for those of us that can't do that, boy, it just shows, right? Yeah. We carry it. We carry it. We show it, right? And in, in Cain's, Cain's uh, situation, it's like he's, he's showing his anger. Now, God hasn't confronted him yet, but he's angry. And actually, God confronts him because of that very reason, because he shows he is angry. And so that's why God now is going to come and says, why are you angry and your, and your countenance, your face is falling, is downcast. Why? Why are you angry? And you ask yourself, well, whom is Cain angry with? At whom is he angry? You know? And the, the, the reality is that you have to think is, okay, Cain just did something wrong. His conscience is telling him, you did something wrong. He's, being, he's accusing himself of doing something wrong. He is angry. He is upset. But guess who's going to pay for it? Abel is going to pay for it. Because when we are angry with ourselves, you know, other people end up paying for it. You know what the psychologists call that uh, projection? We project unto others what we are going through, what we're feeling, what we don't like. So, so you know, there's the old saying, right? There's the old saying, you know, that it takes one to know one. You know, you know, like like when 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 you uh, when you see somebody say, I can't stand that person. You know, I can't stand that person because this person is because of this and that and that. And you know what you're saying is, I can't stand that person because it's just like me. So when you're, when you're finding yourself saying, I can't stand that person, you better look at the mirror. You're, you're, basically, you're saying, that's what you're saying. That's why the old saying takes one to know one. Right? And so sometimes, you know, what happens is that we end up projecting on others our anger. Right? A parents, when you guys are angry. You know? And I, I know I have experienced, I'm guilty of it. Right? I've been angry with myself and I have projected on my kids. And, I, I, and it shows that I'm angry with them. But when reflecting on it, I'm going, I'm not angry at my kids. I'm angry at myself, at me. Has, have you experienced that? Yeah. Where you realize, you know what, I'm not angry at them. I'm angry at me. I just, I'm, just, I, I'm just letting it out on them. And we let it out on, on those, whoever is close to us, the, the nearest to us. So when we're angry, it's like, please don't come near. We should have a sign that says, do not approach. Danger, 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 do not approach. Person angry right now with self. <laughs> do not come near. That is exactly what is happening with Cain. Cain is angry, and God is going to approach it, uh, confront him. And he says to him, uh, verses uh uh, 7 through 8. He says, so uh, verse 6, so the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? And he says something interesting. He says, if you, if, if you do well, will you not be accepted? Here's the, here's the resolution. Here's the solution to your problem, Cain. If you would have done what was right 
and your attitude, your approach as you came to my presence was right, then you would have been accepted. Right? That's what he's saying. He says, and why has your countenance fallen? Why do you display so much anger, so much hatred? And he says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now, sometimes, you know, uh, translations, they, uh, th this is the New King James, by the way. I, I decided that this year I'm going to be reading most, most of the time from the New King James uh, decision that I made this, just this week. <laughs> so I know that most of the time I've, I've read from the NIV, but I'm going to start reading from New King James. Amen. So I, I like the, the Living Bible. I like the way that the Living Bible renders this passage. Okay, this is verses 6 and 7. He says, this is the way that the, uh, the, the, living trans the living Bible tells it. Why are you angry? The Lord asked him. Why is your face so dark with rage? It can, be, it can be bright with joy if you will do what you should do, what you should. It can, listen to that. It can be bright with joy if you, if you will do what you should. But if you refuse to obey... Watch out! Sin is waiting to attack you, longing to destroy you, but you can't conquer it. Oh, wow! I, I like the way that the, you know, the Living Bible puts it. Because that is exactly right. You know, I, you know when, when sin comes, you know, James tells us that when we are being tempted, do not say that you are being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted, nor does he tempt anyone. Right? He cannot be tempted by evil, nor, nor, nor does he tempt anyone. He's, but rather, it is by your own conc concup ah. concupiscences. By your own evil desires. I'm going to say it the simple way. I'm trying to use the big words. By your own evil desires, by your own evil thoughts, you know, when they give life, it gives life to sin. And so, you know, that is actually, actually, so, so what is James saying? James is saying the same thing. Listen, God is not going to tempt you. I didn't make you feel that way. God is saying, I didn't make you feel that way. It is sin that is, which is trying to control you. It wants to control you. It wants to destroy you. That's what sin does. You see, sin is like a drug. See, sin is like a drug. You know, drug, you know, I, I got to imagine that people get addicted to drugs because when they are under the influence, they, it must feel good for them. It must have a good feeling. Whatever it is, I thank God I never had, I never tried drugs. I thank God for that. So when people tell me, you don't know what, I, what, what drugs it feels like, I, I tell them, you're right. I never had it, thank God. But, but they say that it is this, this, this high that they go through. You know, and they, they feel elevated and they feel like this whole other round, right? But guess what happens? Is then it starts controlling you. That's called addiction. And so you become addicted. And that is what sin does too. Sin tries to addict you. Make you addicted to it. Because it, it, it seeks to control us. Right? That's what sin does. And you know what, what happens when we, when, we, uh, we, when we let sin control us? We feel bad and we're angry. Oh, I can't believe I, I did this and I can't believe I did that. You know, and we get angry at ourselves, right? And, and, but, but we go back to it and we start doing it again. And then we go feel bad again, right? And we get angry. And why am I doing this, right? That is what sin does. Temptation, sin is terrible. It will control us. But God says, but you can control it. That's what God says. You can control it. But what we need to realize is that I cannot control it unless I have God who helps me control it. Unless Jesus, unless his Holy Spirit is in me, flowing in me and empowering me, I then can control sin. So Christians, you and I, because the Lord lives in us, the Holy Spirit dwells in us, you and I do not have to succumb. We do not have to be enslaved by sin. We are more than conquerors. We are victorious. Amen. 
You don't have to succumb to temptation. You can overcome because the word of God tells us that we can. We can overcome it. Now, if we don't, it's going to master us. It's going to control us. And then we're going to be angry with ourselves. And it's going to show. And then you're going to be angry with everyone else. And it's everyone else's fault except yours. Wait, I don't know. I'm preaching more in fire in the English service than the Spanish service. Because I know the camera people are going, whoa, that, he, didn't, he didn't do that in the, English, in the Spanish. <laughs> so church, church, we don't have to succumb to, to temptation, to, you know, to sin. We don't. We just need to check our hearts and ask ourselves, is my relationship with God good? Do I have a good relationship with God? Am I right with God? And if, you, if your conscience accuses you, remember, God is greater. And if your conscience, you see, you know, you know what the solution for Cain was? He needed to repent. He just needed to repent. And if, he, if, if Cain would have come to God when God confronts him, because God will confront us not with the intent to condemn us, but with the intent to reconcile us, to forgive us. So you, start, you feel bad right now for what you've done? Be, feel glad that you feel bad. The problem is when you don't. Because sometimes, you know, sin comes in such a way that we don't even feel bad anymore. And when you don't feel bad anymore, you are enslaved to it. You think you're in control. You think you got the power, but you don't. You're weak. You have been weakened by your evil desires. Wow. So I love it. I'm going to read it one more time. Because I, I want this to sink in. I love the way it says it. It can be bright with you, with, with joy. Well, let me read the whole thing, the verses 6 and 7. Why are you angry? The Lord asked him. Why is your face so dark with rage? It can be bright with joy if you will do what you should. It can be bright with joy. Church, come on, li listen to those words. It can be bright. I, you can be a happy man, a happy woman, if you just do what is right. Because when you don't do what is right and you know it, you are disillusioned, you are disappointed, not with anybody else, but yourself. And then you get angry, and boy, I tell you, watch out, because sometimes we end up projecting that anger into other people, right? Watch out. So it says, it can be bright with joy if you will do what you should, but if you refuse to obey... Now, listen, who's in control there until, up to that point? If you refuse, that means you and I are in control. Because if you refuse to obey, that means you still have a choice. If you refuse to obey, watch out. Oh, I love that. Watch out. Sin is waiting to attack you, longing to destroy you. Wow. See, the attack of sin is not just to hurt you. It wants to destroy you. For the wages of sin is what? Yeah. But you can conquer it. You can conquer it. You know, the, the, the reality is, is that we, we, we come to realize, you know, it's not so much, it's not what we do. God is not so interested in me. It is very important, but that is, God is not so interested in what we do. God is interested with our life in the person. You, you, God loves you. God wants to have a relationship with you. And, and that relationship, it should be a relationship that transforms us, that changes us from the inside out. And you know what? And when we are transformed by God, then it also, it will also show on our faces. Amen. It will also, just like your anger shows, it will also show that you have the joy of the Lord in your, in your heart. If, if, yes. It will show. And that's what, you know, you, you, you feel glad. You feel, you know, joy confident. Right? 
you, 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 you are going to just be a whole different person. And, and you know, it, there's a, there's a, uh, you know, this idea of, of needing a you know, sacrifice, the idea of sacrifice, sacrificing to God, you know, as we come to his presence, the idea of coming to his presence, right? That's what we do when we sing the songs. We're not just singing a song, church. We're not just being a choir. We are singing so our song, our singing, a sing can be acceptable to God and that God can receive it. That's why we pray, and that's sometimes why we pray, and sometimes we need to have a, a time of confession, saying, God, I, I need to confess. Before I start worshiping you, God, let me check myself. Right? Let me check myself. Let me check my attitude. And when you do, and you confess, and you, you know, make things right with God. I mean, when we celebrate communion, isn't, isn't it communion about relationship? Isn't that, isn't that why Paul exhorts us to, to, to uh, examine ourselves? Because you see, to, to be in communion with God, right? To be in communion with God is to, is to be in fellowship with Him. is to be in relationship with Him. Amen? And to have the, the, the things in common with God. To be like God. That's what communion is about. It's to be like Him. It's like, I'm pursuing to be like Him. Amen? And, and, and so, you know, we, we have to realize, you know, there's, there's a passage where Jesus says, you know, that, you know, how, how we need to love God above everything. Because that is what it's about. Is loving God. He says, he who does not hate his father or mother, he is not worthy to be my disciple. He who is not willing to live his brother and sister, you know, and everything behind, right, for my sake, he's, he cannot be my disciple. And sometimes you wonder, well, wait a minute, does God, does that mean that God want me to, wants me to hate my mother and father? Of course not. Of course, that's not what God is saying. What God is saying is put me first, love me first. Love in such a way that, that it will seem as if you hate your brother, your, your father and mother. That you hate everyone else because you love me so much. You know, it's like, you know, we were talking about, you know, uh, someone asked me the question about, it, which is a great question. When Jesus, you know, when that young rich man comes to Jesus and he says, he calls him good teacher. Right. And, and, and then and then, you know, I so said, why? Why does he call him good teacher? And and, and uh, he says, Jesus asked, why do you call me good teacher? Right. What was Jesus trying to do? You know, I wonder if Jesus is saying, hey, what do you know about me? Because you call me good because only God is good. Now, what do you what do you know about me? What do you believe about me? And also is Jesus. I believe Jesus is looking to exalt God, God's goodness. That God is so good that it doesn't matter how good we are, we are evil in comparison to his goodness. Right? Uh, don't get offended. That, that's a good thing. That's, I mean, you want to have a good God like that. That You want to have a good, uh, such a good God that your goodness, it, it, it looks like evil. Because that's how good he is. It's not degrading you, it's exalting him. Amen? And so in the same way, when we say that, you know, God loves us, we need to love God. We need to love God in such a way that it appears as if we hate mother and father. But I know Jesus doesn't want me to do that. I know that Jesus actually, because he's not going against his own commandments. Right? You remember the Ten Commandments? How, what's the, the, the first commandment in rela uh, from the Ten Commandments? Right? What is the first commandment in relationship to one another? To other re human relationships? Which is the first one? What? Love what? Love your father and mother. And he, he even promises to bless us if we do that, right? With a long life. So there's, I see people, you know, that, you know, that are up in ages. Wow, you must have been a good child. <laughs> I hope I, long, I love, live a long life now. I changed my mind. Because <laughs> I, want, I want to know that I was a good child. <laughs> But so here's the thing. So Jesus is not contradicting him, himself, right? But he wants us to understand the importance. But so so you see, so so we we find that boy, I lost my train of thought. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Where was I? Help me, guys. Yes. 
on. Thank you. Here we go. So Jesus wants us to understand how important, you know, to, how such a priority God ought to be in our lives. He wants to have the first place in our lives, church. God wants to have the first place. You say, well, why? Why does God want the first place in our lives? You know why? Because when God has the first place in our lives, then we are going to be the best human beings we can be. Seriously. You see, when, when you love God so much that when God says, honor your father and mother, you're going to say, you know what? I'm going to honor my father and my, and my mother because God wants me to because I love God. And you're going to be, you're, you're going to be the best children. We are going to be the best children because we love God. My love for God should make me the best husband. My love for God should make me the best parent. My love for God should make me the best employee. Why? Because I put God first and he wants my obedience. And my obedience is the best sacrifice that I can give to God. Amen. And when I obey God and I am pleasing to him, then I will be happy. I will rejoice. Amen. I'm going to be a happy man. And guess what God wants for you? He wants you to be happy. So God says, all I want you to do is obey me. And if you do, then you will be happy. Because I want you to be happy. And it will show. It will show. So church, you know, when we think about why we ought to you know, give God the best. We ought to give God the best because we love him. And when we give the God the best, we will get the best life out of it. You will be the best human being that, any, that, that you can be. Because then you, you have a relationship with God. Such a relationship, such a tight relationship that you're just starting to look like him. Hallelujah. You know? You're just starting to look like him. And when people see you, you say, are you a Christian? <laughs> There's something different about you. Oh, yeah, because, you know, I, I, I hope I'm starting to look like my daddy. I, I want to look like my daddy. Amen? Don't you? I want to look like my daddy. Hallelujah. Amen. And, that, and so, therefore, you know what? God says, I want you more than I want. I want your sacrifice. I want your service. But you got to remember, I want you the most. Amen? And when we give ourselves to God first, then we are going to give God the best of us. Amen? How many of us want to give God the best? Let, then let's, let, let's start with giving ourselves to him. Amen? Father, we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Oh, Father, we praise you. We give you glory and honor. And we just ask you, Father, that you would help us remember that, Lord, you are more interested in us than what we have to offer, even though what we have to offer to you is important. But, Lord, you put more importance on, on us, on our relationship with you. So we thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, may, may we be the men and women of God that know how to be pleasing to you and find in that way of living a joyous life. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. And everybody said, amen. amen. God bless the church.